We've already got lots of folks on the line, and we have a lot to get through today, so we're going to give folks literally less than a minute to sign on, and then we'll get started. So thank you for your patience. Okay, so we are going to get started. Again, welcome. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm from Niapris. And today is our fourth and final webinar in our outcome series. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping rules. So today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the MCTAC website. We do encourage all of our participants to use the chat box to type in questions throughout the presentation today, and we've set aside some time um, for Q&A at the end. And we do, uh, when you are ch typing into the chat box, please type in your questions to all panelists. So we've had such a great um, number of participants attending these last three, and, three webinars, and today's webinar has a, a big attendance as well. So I wanted all of you to know that we're working on putting together an office hour to sort of close out this series, um, and that's going to be taking place in June. So please stay tuned for information about that. Um, and just a reminder that the information and the timelines that we're talking about are as current as of the date of today's presentation. Okay, so what is MCTAC? Um, I'm pretty sure all of you guys know this, but we will go through it quickly. MCTAC offers training and technical assistance to mental health and substance use providers throughout New York State with the goal of assisting providers with the transition to managed care. So here are all of our uh, MCTAC and CTAC partners, and these are all of the Small Business Initiative partners, and the goal of the Small Business Initiative is to assist providers with less or no experience sometimes filling Medicaid with the transition to managed care. Okay, so we're lucky to have three presenters with us today. We have Emily Kingman from ICL, Ann Cuppinger from CTAC, and David Worsnick is back from CCSI. All right, so I'm going to pass this over to David, who's going to get us started. And just another reminder, please do use the chat box, and we'll be keeping track of questions as they come in. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to pass the ball over to David. All right. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, for all the folks that have been with us for the, all four presentations, um, I hope you're finding the information that uh, we've been providing to you useful. Um, I would encourage that once we set a date for our office hours, uh, that you join us uh, with your questions. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to do a, a little bit deeper dive uh, for any kind of individual concerns or questions that you have. So today we're going to, the, 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 the title of today's um, presentation was How to Use Your Data. But before we do that, we're going to step a little bit back just a little bit in the process and talk about workflows. Um, I'll be doing that, and we'll be talking about how you may think about becoming a data-informed organization, and then Emily will be addressing the whole quality improvement process and how you can really uh, use your data to inform your, your practice and support your decision-making. So let's jump into this. Um, and so what do I mean when I talk about uh, workflows? Well, something that we need to think about. So you have an outcome, and you may do a quick run at your data, and you may find that um, it's a process outcome. The example that we've been using all along through this presentation is evaluations within 10 days of an initial call. So you may pull your data out, and suddenly and you, you look at it, 
and you see that you, you, you know the the benchmark that you want to set for your organization is 100%. But your actual experience before you really start this project is that you're not doing that well. Well, what happens in that situation? Something needs to change. I mean, whatever process that you have in place right now is not going to be sufficient for your organization to meet your metrics. So when we when we think about this process, then we have to really address process and workflows uh, that need to be put in place to assure that you'll be successful. Uh, so one of the things that sometimes, and probably in a lot of cases, meeting outcome metrics will require new or modified processes. What you're doing today doesn't work. You need to change that. Uh, you need to take into consideration that staff will need to take on new, new roles and, and have different tasks. Um, you may need to um, evaluate staff performance differently. Um, as you set up your workflows, you may have timelines that you need to hold people accountable to that you need to evaluate, or the accuracy of their work. You may not have evaluated their performance in these areas before. So you have to think a little bit differently about how you view staff performance. Information will need to flow efficiently. I know sometimes in our organization we have processes and, you know, we don't really think through the processes very well and we create bottlenecks. So information doesn't, doesn't move correctly. I mean, workflows are normally uh, processes that are dependent upon work that becomes, that comes before each individual employee set of re responsibilities. So information is going to need to flow efficiently and effectively. Transparency will gain importance. If you have problems within a, within a workflow, you need to understand where those problems are. You need to understand if they're system problems or people problems. So transparency will gain in importance. Uh, effectiveness of your process will need to be measured and evaluated. So we may be measuring outcomes, and that, that, that outcomes will tell us, in many cases, whether our processes are working effectively. But you need to take a look at those. Those need to be evaluated. And quality improvement will obviously be critical, and we'll be talking, um, Emily will be talking more about that later. So what's a workflow? People, most people know what a workflow is. There's a couple of key uh, aspects that, that I think about in workflows. Um, uh, workflows are really, they're a process uh, towards an end. Uh, it's dependent on people and other resources. And it's an interactive process. Uh, workflows normally start in, have a starting. They have an ending. There's people in between. Information flows. People, some people in the process are dependent upon people that come before them in a process. Um, so, I mean, you have workflows and processes all across your organization. But to be effective with your outcomes, you need to really uh, clearly articulate the workflows that are necessary to support your success. So when I think about creating and implementing workflows, I try to think of what's, what's the simplest, uh, simplest approach. And, and I sort of land on the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, so as you think about building your, your workflows and processes, this could be a, a sort of a standard, easy framework that, that you can sort of land on. And that's the who's. Uh, who's involved, who are the staff that are involved, the what, which is to define the responsibilities each staff will have, the when, defining the timing for each activity, the where, that's for me is sort of a map of where the tasks fit into the process, what the flow looks like, and the why, like communication to the staff. And that's a key piece. We ask people to do things all the time. Um, but often we don't communicate to the staff of the, the why. Why are we doing this? What is the importance? 
in making it clear that the role that they play. Let's take a look at these a little bit more closely. Um, so the who. Processes of people-based. Uh, you know, in, in our environment, uh, we depend on our staff um, and for all of our, our workflows. And so the first step in the who is to identify each staff position that will contribute to the process. I mentioned each staff position because one of the things that I, I think is important in these workflows is for you to document them. Um, it could be a sheet of paper, or it could be a whiteboard, it could be anything, but you really need to document your workflows and have that available for people. Um, and you can identify staff. I in here talked about identifying staff positions. Staff come and go. Uh, your processes will be there for a long period of time when you document. Uh, uh, you know, my recommendation is to document positions as opposed to people. But an example in, in, in the example that we've been working on throughout this presentation, so the who. Well, the intake worker is going to log calls and schedule assessments. The clinical supervisor is going to manage the clinical staffing uh, to assure that, you, that these um, evaluations can be done in the time frame. Receptionists at the site will identify evaluation no-shows. So it's a process. Everybody has a role to play. The first step is to identify what, who these, what positions these are. Uh, and that is the first stage in starting to build out your workflows. So the next is the what. Then, you know, my recommendation is clearly articulate and document the task that each staff will perform. You can never get too detailed about asking, uh, uh, of clearly documenting uh, what you expect from individuals. So. As an example here, and let's take in our example, the intake worker. Well, what do we expect of the intake? We expect them to log the, the date of all calls on a call log, all calls. Uh, they're responsible for looking up the consumer in the EHR and flagging those consumers that have been seen in the last six months because, as you remember, those won't be part of the, our our cohort that we're going to measure. They have to schedule evaluations in the electronic schedule. They may have another couple of roles in this process, but you have to clearly lay out what you expect of them. Um, and I think that that certainly is, is stage two in your development of your workflows. So then there's the when. Processes are in workflows are only effective when tasks are timed properly. So you need to determine when each task needs to be performed and again communicate your and, and document your expectations. So let's go back and talk about an example. So in our, in our example, we would expect that the intake worker will answer all calls within three rings that they will schedule appointments within two business days, that they will inform the supervisor immediately when there's no slots available for them to schedule an evaluation within two days. So what you're seeing here is the when's become, I believe, critical. It's when do you expect something, somebody to do something. It doesn't do any good. If you have an expectation that all evaluations are scheduled within two days of a call, but the individual who is trying to schedule the call waits three days to inform the clinical supervisor that there's no slots available. Uh, the first time that happens, you're stepping outside of your workflows and your expectations. So the wins, I think, become really critical um, and when do you expect uh, certain activities to take place? I can't stress that much. Now, the other piece that uh, you know you may want to think about when you're talking with people in in uh, in um, 
putting together your workflows is what level of uh, accuracy you expect. So you expect your intake worker to inform the clinical supervisor immediately 100% of the times. There are certain functions within your workflow that you need to be done 100% of the time. Or there could be functions where you could have a little bit of margin, but be clear with people because as I talked about earlier, you're going to need to rethink how you look at your staff performance and your responsibility is to assure that your staff clearly understand what you expect of them. And that's not only the timing, but also the accuracy of their work. So be thinking about that when you build your workflows. So there's the where. I think it's always helpful to visually map out your workflow. It doesn't have to be the, um, you know, you don't have to buy a set of software to be able to um, build out your workflows and care about the different symbols and what they need, mean. It could be something very simple, but I think a visual tool to help people see the process, its component parts, and know the staff involved is a critical aspect, not only of buy-in, but of understanding. So here's a, so a larger example there. You know, this is not your standard workflow. This is kind of chart. This is just to help people understand that we have, you know, there's key components of this. Initial call is a component, and evaluation is a component. You know, a missed appointment is an important piece of the process. And, you know, build this sort of visual tool for, to help people understand the whens and where they fit into the process. And then um, the whys, and this, again, is a pretty critical aspect is that you need to communicate with your staff. You need to help everybody understand why the process is important, how their role is critical to the process, because everybody's role is critical to the uh, process, and the goals that you're trying to achieve. Really, and part of developing and redesigning workflow engagement and buy-in is an important piece. You can only engage and get people to buy in as if they clearly understand the process, their roles, and what we're trying to accomplish here. So I meet with all the staff involved with the workflow together. Everybody's in the same room, on the same page. They have the visualization. You have this conversation. Outline the outcomes related to both success and failure. What happens when we're successful? What's going to happen when we're not successful? And point to the value for your consumers. Um, you know, that because that's really what we're trying to, to achieve here. So those are my sort of ways that I think about workflows and some of the things that uh, you may want to be thinking about. Now I'm going to um, pass this over to Ann, and she's going to continue with talking about making a shift to a, um, a more data-driven organizational structure. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So I think any of you who've been involved in any kind of change process will recognize the reaction of the woman on the right-hand side of this cartoon who's saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't how we normally do things. And deep down, she's also saying, um, you know, uh, I kind of like how we do it. I know how we do it. I'm comfortable with the way we do it. And, uh, you know, she's happy about that. So, um, you know, your job as a leader and your job if you're the, the woman herself is to, you know, sort of engage in this process, but to think about how to do it in a way that makes it accessible to people. So in the past, you know, the focus really sometimes has been on measuring the height of the files more than on using the information in the files to understand your work better or measure outcomes. So with this new system transformation that we have underway for both adult and children's providers, it's going to require organizations um, and individuals in those organizations to open up those files and to look at the data and to use that data to inform and improve your work. So in the course of making this transition to a more data-driven uh, culture, 
it's really easy to focus on technology, statistics, the sort of math side of the equation. All of that's important, but the human side of it is equally important because, you know, given the kinds of things David was just talking about, if the folks that actually need to carry out these uh, procedures and uh, be open to thinking about how they change their work are not engaged and don't really understand and don't have the tools to make this shift, um, it's, you know, all the technology in the world won't get you anywhere. So um, when, we, uh, when we look at what we mean by data-driven, maybe you can take a look at this continuum and think about where is your organization on that continuum? Are you really just collecting a lot of data that's gathering dust? Are you maybe starting to use that data in a, you know, a beginning way to understand your organization better? Maybe asking some questions about what are the, what's the, what are the demographics of the people we serve? How many hours a week of direct face-to-face -face service do we provide? Or maybe you're actually starting to move further along and you're making decisions and innovating based on the data. That final stage is really what we mean by being data-driven. And you, it really is asking you to routinely use data to inform everything you do, from your outreach strategy to how you train your staff to the kinds of strategies and techniques that you're using with the folks that you work with, financial planning, um, and, you know, guiding your innovation, too. You know, looking at the data to help you decide, oh, it might be time for us to provide this other type of service that's really in need but not available in our community. So when we talk about organizational culture, uh, everybody here is familiar with the concept of organizational culture, if only because as you have moved from job to job, you've felt the differences in how those institutions and organizations operate. Um, are people very open? Do, uh, do leaders, does leadership communicate regularly with all staff at all levels? Um, is it very rigid or is there room for innovation? So these ideas that are listed on the screen here, are some of the ingredients that go into organizational culture. They're not the only ingredients, and an organization, especially a large one, may have subcultures. What's important here is to, you know, kind of take a step back, whatever your role is in your organization, and kind of reflect on this and think a little bit about what kinds of unwritten, sometimes subtle, and sometimes pretty overt rules and patterns and routines and habits are shaping the way that you do work. And then to think about those things in terms of how they impact um, becoming more data-driven. So the kinds of questions you might look at in terms of organizational culture and this question of being data-driven are, are metrics discussed at meetings? Are people using data and supervision? Who has access to the data in your organization? Are staff knowledgeable about the costs that are associated with the services that they provide? Would a frontline staff person feel comfortable coming to you as an executive to propose a change? And are you sending a message that you're going to, you under, that you understand that this change is, uh, you know, going to be difficult for some people and that you're going to support them to make the change, but that you definitely expect it to happen. So I think, you know, stepping back sometimes and taking a look, you know, trying to like look from above at your own organization um, can be really helpful. So these are some important aspects of organizational culture when it comes to becoming data-driven. It, it's not just about collecting the information. Are you going to use it to support change and improve the work you do? Does your organization encourage collaboration? All the research around becoming data-driven strongly suggests that siloed data is not helpful. Your QI people, your financial people, your frontline staff, if you have a transportation department, your bus drivers, all need to be thinking about and looking at and making decisions based on the data. Um, and that if you only look in a very narrow piece of the world, you're not going to get the kinds of outcomes that you want. Do you value transparency? You know, we'll talk a little bit about external transparency, but for this particular conversation, internal transparency is also important. Um, it can be, you know, kind of typical of organizations to not want to really give everybody all the information. And, of course, you'll have to make some strategic decisions about what you can share and where there are privacy issues. But as a general rule, um, it pays to allow people to really, um, you know, take a look at what all of the information that pertains to their work. And finally, do you have a growth mindset? And growth mindset is a concept that comes out of education. And it's really, it, when, it, when it all, in a nutshell, what it says is, do you believe 
as an organization and have you empowered the people in your organization to believe that the most important thing is learning and growing as opposed to perfection? And do you understand that your uh, hard work uh, and your efforts make a difference? So folks who are in a growth mindset, you don't hear them saying it is what it is. You have them thinking much more about what could be possible. Um, and that is something you as a leader can actually influence. So it's really important to not assume that people are not interested, that your staff are not interested in data, that they're not going to cooperate, that it's just not going to work. Because, you know, there certainly is a buzz about many organizations because folks are being asked to gather a lot of information and there's a lot of paperwork. Um, and that does need to be looked at and you need to think about what's doable for staff. But I want to share a quick story with you. I worked with a community many years ago in the preparation of a huge federal grant. It was a Children's System of Care grant. And um, I was there as the grant writer, and I was not familiar with this community. So I was asking them for a lot of data that I could look at to help me understand their community and to help them shape the goals and objectives in their proposal. So one of the questions I asked was, what kind of disparities, racial and ethnic disparities, are there in this community in terms of how children are served or outcomes, things like that? And they said, very genuinely, we really don't have any disparities. And so I said, okay, well, let's get, why don't you bring on the data and we'll take a look at that. So, of course, then they said, where do we get that? Which to them and me was a clue that they didn't really know whether they had disparities or not. What was really key here is leadership completely embraced this question. They didn't even know where to look for the data, but they were totally open to partnering with other folks in the community, gathering that information both in terms of numbers and also through conversations with various folks in the community to learn a little more, a bit more about what disparities look like in their community. And they proceeded to implement changes that really made a difference in their community because they were open. And when we put some numbers in front of them about things like rates of suspension and the use of um, involvement in the juvenile justice system and the use of high-end services without ever having received any community-based services, they could see that there were disparities, and it was, it, they were unnerved by it and motivated by it. So this is just, uh, uh, you know, a little wisdom from Lewis Carroll. For those of you who are leaders, you're going to have to set a clear direction that this is the agency that your the direction that your agency is moving in, and also some clear targets. You can't do everything, but you'll, you may have uh, an area that you're going to focus on. Uh, because, uh, you know, Alice asked for direction, the Cheshire Cat said, where do you want to go? She said, I don't much care. And then the Cheshire Cat said, then it doesn't matter which way you go. So that setting of direction is going to be really important in this process. I would encourage everyone not to wait until they have a perfect plan, but take the plunge. The first thing you need to do is inventory what data you currently have in your organization. Share that data with staff. Maybe try to get it in some sort of format that they can utilize because you can't always just make good use of raw data. And model for them how you look at data and just ask questions. Wow, look at that. There are 80% of the kids who are suspended from school are kids of color. I wonder why that is. Just start to teach them that you can look at these things not with the idea of a right or wrong answer, but with the idea of asking questions and learning. Make the question asking a very open process. Just start to think, what, what, what do we need to know? What could we learn from this data? What would we like to know that we don't have any data to help us answer? Just really start the question asking and let it be sort of free range. You also need to really empower your staff. David talked a little bit about this. They need clear guidelines about what's expected of them. They need training in some cases. They may need support. They need, um, they need access to the data for people to buy into this. Um, they need to feel like the data that they put in comes back to them in ways that are useful to them in, in performing their own job. Um, you know, when I say teach data analysis at all levels, we're not teaching people SPSS or SAS. We're teaching people, like, really just that kind of habit of not just accepting the report and putting it in a file, but looking at it and saying, huh, I wonder why my number of face-to-face -face visits went down by 50% in the last two months. And then maybe to give them some help, posing some theories and thinking about what that might be and how they might change that. 
So you also need to provide them with, um, you know, helpful tools and reports, and that's something that will grow as you gain experience. Like, what is the best way to give people this information? Is it a dashboard? Is it a weekly report? Is it a monthly report? Um, and that will uh, really empower your staff to use the information. And finally, if you're going to give people information that suggests a need for improvement, you also have to give them the room to experiment. Uh, take some risks, obviously within bounds, whatever your, you know, requirements are, um, to experiment with change. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through these so we can move on to Emily, but, you know, you don't want to start with something huge. You do not need an elaborate data system to get this process started. A lot of people would say to me, we don't have any data. And I'd say, well, do you have an intake form? And they'd say, oh, yeah, we have an intake form. And I said, does that ask these questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, we always ask those questions. And, and I said, well, then you have data. Uh, the challenge may be to figure out how to enter it somewhere um, and to use it, but you do have data, and you want to start with a project that will have value to your staff um, to help increase their buy into the whole process. Zero in on something that you can actually make a difference on um, within a short time frame, or not in, make a difference on and then try some new approach, but something that you can look at within a short time frame. So whether or not your four-year-old preschoolers graduate from college would not be a great place to start. Whether or not you can change your outreach strategy and influence the demographics of the people you serve, that is something that you might be able to do in the short run. Um, and also, you may be starting with descriptive and process kinds of measures as opposed to true outcome measures, because those are a little easier to start with. So, um, and you just want to foster new habits, you know, make metrics part of every day, of every conversation, of every staff meeting, of every supervision. Focus on outcomes, not just activities. Because we build, we very focused on activities. This is what we did, we can build for it. And you get praised for activities. Wow, you know, you saw this many families this week. Um, but really try to, you know, you're going to have that focus, of course, but you're also going to want to focus on whether or not all of that made a difference. And, you know, you've had, the, we've heard about this conversation around value-based, and that is where you're going to be needing to, you know, do some finessing of the information around outcomes, costs, and um, activities. So, uh, and finally, make sure that data speaks louder than opinion. Um, if you allow the organization to make decisions without using data, then there's no incentive for people to have to use data to make decisions. Now, that doesn't mean every single decision has to be tied up with, you know, a chart, but it should always be part of your culture to be saying, um, what information has led us to suggest this change, and how can we track whether or not it was effective? Finally, I think of all of this, you know, communication is key, um, and you really have to look at how you're communicating within your organization, and also sticking to it. Um, th there is going to be resistance, there are going to be bumps in the road, but if people discover that you ask them to start doing some of this, and then you don't follow through, um, it starts to look like something that's not really important. So really make a plan and provide adequate staff support and time to sustaining this implementation of all of this. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Emily, it should be it with you there. Let me move it for you in case it's not coming through. Okay, I see it. I don't know if I can move it. There, it should um, be with you now. It looks like you should be able to move it. Great. Thank you, Anne. Hi, I'm Emily from ICL, and I'm going to walk you through a concrete example to really illustrate everything that's been said so far um, and how to use data to improve the quality of your services and achieve better outcomes. So I think first it's important to acknowledge that quality improvement requires carving out time to think and to strategize, uh, and then time to do the work. Both thinking and action are required to make lasting change, and it can feel hard and overwhelming to find the time um, to do this, but in the end it'll really pay off because uh, your, your teams, your programs, your services will be more efficient and more effective. So it is not allowing me to control. May I move it back over to Daniela? And perhaps, Daniela, you could advance the slides for me. I apologize for the technical issue. 
no worries, Emily. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, so next slide. So being data informed helps us to clearly see, um, based on evidence, the areas that need improvement. So it's helpful to review data with your team regularly, including data around productivity and services provided, and also related to health and recovery outcomes that you're working towards, like gaining employment or reducing hospitalizations. Sometimes when looking at the data, you may find that uh, it doesn't look exactly the way you wanted it to look, which can be discouraging. So I think it's really important to, to reframe that um, and approach it as a discussion um, with a spirit of investigation and curiosity, and that as a team, you are problem solving together, you're generating new, generating new solutions to try, thinking of ways to innovate, um, and the focus is really not on what you're doing wrong, but on what new strategies you can implement. Next. So um, this is the example that we have been uh, looking at throughout the series of um, the dashboard uh, showing the indicator for initial evaluation performed within 10 days of initial contact. Uh, and this is a real outcome metric from the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Initiative. As we can see, the clinic has been monitoring their data over the course of the year, and it started to take a, a dip in performance. So this is certainly something that we'd want to improve. Next. So there's a simple quality improvement method called Plan, Do, Study, Act that can be applied to this situation uh, or really any outcome or process that you'd like to improve. Uh, you can think of it kind of as doing an experiment uh, but without the rigor of research. So it's a simple structured approach that can help you uh, make a change and then measure it to see if your change had an impact. Next slide. So the first step in the process is to plan. So you want to seek to understand the causes of a problem, and then, um, you know, so you might do this through a team discussion and, and have the, uh, different kinds of theories about what are the root causes of the problem might be. And then you want to go back and check out the data and make sure that people's kind of, um, you know, gut theories or experience or anecdotal evidence um, is backed up by data. And then uh, you want to generate a bunch of possible solutions to address those uh, root causes, those problems. And then pick a change that you want to test. So uh, think about, you know, what new change would you want to try, what do you think will happen and why, and then develop a plan of action uh, with clearly defined roles, including uh, a, a way of collecting data and measuring the impact of your change. Next slide. So the next step in the process is uh, the do piece. And do actually just means that you put your plan into action. Uh, so that part is pretty simple. Then uh, after a set period of time, you're going to study your results. So what happened? Review the data, uh, summarize findings. You're going to find likely to, um, in looking at it, that along the way there was probably some unanticipated challenges or barriers that came up. So um, you're, you're going to want to take a look at that and, and see um, how, how that might have impacted your results. Then finally, the last piece of the process is to act, which is really just making a decision. So if you're, the new change that you're testing was effective, then you're going to want to keep that change. Maybe it, you know, worked pretty well, but there's still some tweaking, so then you're going to change or modify your strategy. And then finally, um, if it just like didn't work, you didn't get the result that you were hoping for, that's fine. You're gonna toss out that strategy and try something new. Next slide. So we're gonna use this example um, that we've been talking about to uh, take you through a PDSA cycle. So again, we're looking at the percentage of new consumers with initial evaluation provided within 10 business days of first contact. So our goal as an organization is 100%, and then we can see from this graph that 
in the month of, no, you know, we started to dip, and in the November, we dipped down to 47%. So we want to we want to get this uh, percentage sliding back up. Next slide. So in a staff meeting, you discuss this, and uh, a few therapists say that you know they've noticed that all the appointments are scheduled um, in a timely manner. That doesn't seem to be the issue. What's happening is that um, the appointment is the initial evaluation appointment is scheduled, and people aren't keeping that appointment. People aren't showing up. So you go back, take a look at the data, check that out, um, and see that, in fact, it is true. There's a high percentage of people who are not showing up for their appointment. So you brainstorm different strategies to address this and then decide that the change that you want to test is that um, you're going to have people make reminder phone calls or send a reminder text message the day before the appointment. And your theory is that by doing this, the percentage of uh, new consumers with an evaluation provided within 10 business days uh, is going to increase from 47% to 80% within 90 days. Next slide. So then the next step is that you are going to um, figure out how you're going to collect data um, to measure the impact of this change that you're testing. So uh, this goes back to the workflows uh, that was talked about earlier. So the intake coordinator is going to enter the date of the first contact in a screening note. Uh, the therapist is going to enter the calls and texts into a contact log. And then um, on the date of the actual appointment, the therapist is going to enter either a progress note for a kept appointment or some sort of informational note uh, indicating that it was a missed appointment. So that's where all your data is going to be coming from. Um, and then the, uh, so the due, the staff is now going to carry out uh, the plan over the next three months. Next slide. So then let's just pretend it's three months later, um, you've put this change into effect and then you're going back and studying and looking to see what the results were. So uh, the, you go and you look, and the therapists were able to contact the consumers the day before 98% of the time. So you have evidence here that the new strategy was implemented consistently, which is important to know. Um, it did turn out an unexpected challenge was that 10% of people didn't have working phone numbers. So that might be, you know, a higher number than you thought, um, which could have potentially uh, skewed the results and made your strategy not work. However, as we can see um, in this in this pretend instance, even with those non-working phone numbers, it still did move the needle quite a bit. So, um, with those people did respond um, and show up more consistently with that reminder phone call, and the people number the percentage of people who kept the evaluation appointment went from 47 percent to 83 percent. So you've reached your target that you had set for this uh, three-month cycle, and so the decision is made to then keep the change in place. Uh, and then the next step is to really start all over again with PDSA cycle number two, um, because we're in a continuous cycle of quality improvement. So our goal is 100%. It's awesome that we moved it to 83%, and now we're going to see what other new change we can add to keep moving us further towards that 100% so that we're always improving. Next slide. So it's important to be in this kind of continuous cycle of quality improvement that will help you keep um, moving forward and make progress towards your desired outcomes. And hand in hand with that is really improving, hand in hand with improving your outcomes is communicating your success. So you have a variety of stakeholders that are very interested and invested in hearing about how your services are helping people to improve their lives. Those include executives, the board, funders and payers, government, staff, people you serve, the larger community, et cetera. I'm sure you have others that you could add to your list. Um, and communicating the success that you're um, achieving, the progress that you're making, um, towards both these, you know, process uh, measures and, and these larger outcome measures is really essential to keeping your doors open and to achieving your mission. Next slide. So for each stakeholder, um, it becomes really important to think about what types of data they might be interested in, because it's going to be different depending on the stakeholder group. 
So thinking about what do they value, what data do they need, and how will they use that information. So a board member has a very different perspective from a program manager or from a person receiving purpose, uh, services. People will want different information in varying levels of detail. For example, a board member um, is going to be very interested in your financial performance, for example, while a person served will be much less interested in that and is going to care a lot more about the quality of your services. They're going to want to know if they come to you, will their questions be answered? Are they going to feel respected um, by their providers? Are they going to feel comfortable in your environment? So really thinking through what data is important to each group. Uh, it's also important to really think about then how, how to present that data. What's the best means to do so given uh, the type of data being presented and who you're presenting it to. Uh, so consider what level of detail you need and then also what's the most compelling and engaging way to share the information. So it might be you know, a report that has tables and graphs in some instances or in others, it might be a video testimonial, testimonial or some type of reviews with stars like Yelp or something like that. Uh, it might be using social media. So there's really a lot of room here for creativity, for thinking outside the box, uh, which I think can be really energizing for, for teams and organizations to think about uh, new and exciting ways to collect data and use it and report it to really help make lasting change and to help more and more people improve their lives. So with that, I'm going to turn it uh, back to Daniela, who's going to tell you how this theme will be picked up on next time in the webinar. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to David and Ann as well. Um, so again, I just want to remind people, please do use the chat box feature to type in your questions. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left for questions. And while you're typing in your questions, uh, I just want to remind you that, yes, um, we are putting together an office hour for the outcome series. That will take place in June. So be on the lookout for announcements from that. And then we do have another webinar in May, scheduled for May 23rd from 12 to 1. Um, it's called Expressing Yourself, How to Craft a Value Proposition. So we're going to go through the elements of a successful value proposition in that webinar. And then we'll be following up that webinar with in-person workshops throughout the state in the Hudson Valley, Albany, uh, Western New York, New York City, and Long Island. Um, and that will be very hands-on and really help folks to um, put together a value proposition, enhance the value proposition you may already have. So with that, let's see if we can get some questions going. So we'll just take another minute or so and uh, look and see what folks are sending in. So just hang in with us for a minute, okay? And while we're um, waiting for questions to come in and organizing them a little bit, I just wanted to reach out to our presenters and ask you if you had any last sort of closing remarks you wanted to add or anything else you wanted to add um, to today's uh, webinar. Thanks, Danielle. This is David. Um, I'm not sure anything yet. I think that that it's what we've tried to do in this outcome presentation is really hit on some of the key aspects of of what you need to do and be thinking about as a as an organization. You remember we started in the beginning in, in you know measuring what matters. Uh, what do you want to begin thinking about? Um, we, we talked more uh, from a technical end of collecting data, the data visualizations, uh, what you need to, how you may want to be thinking about uh, uh, addressing the challenges that you have in your environment of getting the information. And, and then taking that through to, you know, once you've got the data, then what do you do with it? Um, how do you support your organization? Uh, how do you support the decision-making in your organization and improve the quality of services? So 
I said we're really trying to take you through the steps. Just to remind everybody that uh, these, uh, each of these presentations have been recorded. Um, they're posted to the um, CTAC uh, website. You'll see that uh, information in mctac.org, and you'll see that information on your screen right now. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people on this presentation, but there's a lot of people in your organization that you may want to, to provide this information to, so please take advantage of the resources that uh, MCTEC, CTEC is providing. Um, you may want to go back and review some of these, the, some of these uh, presentations with your, with your staff, and I certainly personally want to Thank you for sticking with us, and I've enjoyed uh, working with many talented people on this series, uh, and I think that we, we, we did, um, as a group, did a pretty good job in putting this uh, a contextual framework together for, you, for everybody. So, uh, Danielle, we're back online. We've got any questions we may want to address in the next few minutes? Well, before we do that, um, I wanted to say thank you, David, for that um, reminder about the, the archives webinars. And then, you know, you guys or all our presenters really talked about stressing the importance of not having to go out and purchase software. You know, we really have Excel at our fingertips and can use that um, to collect data and to organize data a little bit. So I don't know if you wanted to mention the other um, webinars or resources uh, that are available from MCTAC that were recorded that can sort of expand on folks' understanding of Excel and using data? Sure. There's, um, we finished last, no, two weeks ago, uh, a three-part series um, that was really specifically uh, targeted towards the use of Excel to be able to begin developing uh, the dashboards and the outcome metrics that you're going to need um, as part of this process. In that series, we started with some basic data um, that was tables, filtering on tables, uh, the structure of information and what that looks like inside of Excel. I do want to mention that we did create a uh, sample clinic database with, I think there was over 9,000 records in that, uh, that is posted to the CTAC website also, uh, sort of to be able to look, look at the recorded um, uh, presentations and then try it out yourself. So we started with the, the tabling piece. Uh, the second piece that we looked at is pivot tables um, and, and, and creating some pivot charts. The example that you saw today in, uh, of the dashboard is created in Excel. Uh, it was created as part of the uh, Excel presentation. And it's a it's a pretty it's using the the um, um, functionality that's baked right into Excel uh, to create what I think is a, a pretty decent uh, visualization. I think that uh, either Anne or Emily mentioned you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be fantastic. It it has to be easy to understand. It has to be accurate. It has to be clear, and, you, and all of you have tools on your desktop right now that, that can help support that process. And the third thing that we did, we looked into a bit more of the higher-end business intelligence tools uh, that are now in, in um, Excel, including the Power Query and the Power Pivot, really as a way of thinking about how you're going to join data from different data sources. I think the realities that we're all going to face is that our EHRs are not going to be sufficient for all the data that we need. Um, in our example, we talked about having initial calls uh, come out of a call log. That might be an Excel call log, and the data about the evaluations may be sitting in your billing systems. And how do we bring these two data sources together into a a single set of data that we can use to create our visualization. So we talked a bit about that also. So 
I think an important piece in, in, in as, as our thinking is what tools are we going to use and how are we going to present our visualizations to our staff. So I'd, I'd really support, I, I'd recommend that you, if you weren't part of that series to go back and take a look. Uh, if you're high level uh, Excel users, right now the pivot table stuff might be a slam dunk, but um, I'm finding that very few people are familiar with the business intelligence tools, the data joining tools, the tools to clean up our, our data, um, and that might be a useful thing for you to take a look at. David, we just got um, a question. What was the add-in to Excel that you just that you had mentioned? Sure, there's um, there's a couple of different uh, ways to go about this, but if you're in Excel 2013 or 2000 uh, or 2000, then there are two add-ins that you'll need. One is called Power Pivot and the other is called Power Query. There's a third that you could take a look at, which is Power View, that is, allows you to create some of the visualizations. But um, we started in our presentation of just using pivot tables and, and pivot charts and graphs to create the visualization. So you need to start with the Power Pivot and the Power View. If you're working inside of Excel 2016, um, those two um, add-ins come um, with the system and with some it, it enhanced uh, capabilities. So as an example, if you're using two th Excel 2016 and your Microsoft Office 365, you, sh and you should have the tools that you need to be able to uh, use those BI tools. Okay, thank you. So I think that you all presenters all did such a fabulous job today about um, sharing information and making it so clear for everyone that we don't have any more questions. So okay. I am going to go ahead and say thank you again to all of our participants um, for joining us today and throughout the series. And thank you, a special thank you to David who is with us for every single one of these uh, webinars throughout the series and our presenters today, Emily and Anne. Thanks so much everyone. Have a great day and don't forget to be on the lookout for the announcement for the um, office hour. Thanks so much.